Our next speaker is Nolan Nichols. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Nolan and I got to know each other through the INCF Data Sharing Task Force mm -hmm. many moons back. Mars may have been closest to Earth again at that point in time. Uh, sure. And Nolan has done an incredible set of work over the years on trying to represent these ontologies in various biomedical spaces. And then he's gone over to the other side uh, and I have no idea what he does. So today <laughs> we are going to hear and find out about what he does on the other side. I hear it's something related to metadata. Yes, yeah, we'll get into metadata. I'll be in, hopefully I'm in the right session. Um, so hello everybody and, and thank you for inviting me to come present today. It's quite exciting to be here. I really see a lot of um, familiar faces and I haven't been to this conference in a couple of years so it's really great to be invited back um, to share what I'm up to and so um, as Satra alluded to so I'm now uh, have moved to the other side and now working in, in industry in this company called Gentech which is a member of a broad organization um, called Roche and uh, so when I'm talking about metadata, meaningful metadata at scale. This is really about, um, you know, at the enterprise level, so there's close to 100,000 employees, um, lots of stuff going on, um, and it's really uh, a challenge in terms of all of the socio-technical socio challenges in terms of getting everybody to work together um, in, able, in order to kind of um, move forward with, with science and precision medicine in the clinical trial space. And so I thought I'd motiv motivate our discussion today um, by introducing uh, we're talking a little bit about one of our trial programs uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, so as many of you know, so Alzheimer's disease is a progressive um, disease of the brain that causes problems with memory, thinking, and behavior. Um, and it's the most common form of dementia. And it's also a large and unmet growing need, um, medical need, where there's over 45 million people worldwide that are affected with Alzheimer's. And uh, that's only growing substantially. And so we desperately need some form of medication to treat uh, these patients. Uh, and not only uh, treat the patients, but also really the caregivers that um, are spending money out of their own pockets and spending their time uh, and, um, to be able to take care of their, their loved ones. And so, um, so in order to uh, kind of address this issue, one piece that we'll, we'll talk about is that um, a little bit of the biology behind uh, the biomarkers and understanding how Alzheimer's progresses is that um, here we have like a popular framework uh, or model around how AD biomarkers that uh, help to do in vivo staging of the disease. And so uh, this model uh, focuses on five of the most well-known biomarkers, uh, which can be divided into either measures of uh, brain amyloid uh, beta uh, deposition and measures of neurodegeneration. And so the major AD biomarkers become abnormal in a temporally ordered manner, uh, where uh, CSF A beta and amyloid PET are dynamic earliest in the disease, uh, followed by CSF tau and uh, FDG PET, followed then by structural MRI, and then followed by clinical symptoms. And so um, the biomarkers that are denoted as upstream uh, are neurodegenerative biomarkers, whereas those that are downstream um, are considered uh, more on the clinical side. And so, um, so within this framework, uh, so right now most of the treatments for Alzheimer's disease are focused on treating the symptoms. Uh, but the general consensus is that earlier treatment is considered to be uh, key in order to prevent or delay the onset of neurodegeneration. And so um, when developing some therapeutics for intervening in this disease, uh, one thing to be aware of is that um, these amyloid plaques are considered to be a key, a key feature in the pathology of AD. Um, and this amyloid precursor protein uh, that's cleaved uh, releases a variety of different isoforms of the amyloid beta uh, peptide. In particular, there's an aggregation of the A beta 42 isoform uh, that leads to these toxic, all right, these toxic uh, oligomers, um, as well as downstream amyloid plaques and tau pathology. And so, um, the downstream uh, beta amyloid aggregation and other uh, processes leading to neurodegeneration um, and neural loss. And so right now our current uh, kind of portfolio of different medications that are being evaluated uh, target uh, both tau, uh, but the ones that are furthest along in the pipeline are this uh, gantrinuramab uh, molecule that targets um, both forms of, of this A beta molecule, so both the oligomers and also the amyloid plaques. And then uh, also this uh, cronuzumab drug that is more specific to uh, 
the um, oligomer form of the, um, of the uh, toxic A beta 42. And so I'll be talking, uh, introducing just a little bit of background about our Cronuzumab plan, our program, uh, and in particular the, the phase two program that, that I'll be discussing kind of in the context of metadata to some extent. So, um, so there are two programs. So there's one that is in a cognition study called ABBY. So this is a larger study. And a second one called BLAZE. And so this is a, a smaller biomarker study. So the enrollment criteria for these two trials uh, focus on moderate or mild to moderate AD uh, where patients that were enrolled were between 50 and 80 years old. Uh, and there were two different arms for both of these trials. So one uh, used a subcutaneous dose of 300 milligrams uh, every two weeks, and the other one was a higher dose that was administered uh, intravenously at uh, 15 milligrams uh, per kilogram every month. Uh, and so this is about a two and a half fold higher um, exposure. And the primary readouts were done after 72 weeks. And so um, the primary endpoint for the Abbey Cognition Study was a change in the ADOS COG, as well as the uh, CDR sum of boxes. And for Blaze, this was primarily um, imaging, medical imaging related. So this was a, a, a PET readout. And so, um, so I'll be focusing just on the Abbey study here and this cognition um, piece of this. And so, um, so in the overall population, uh, the primary endpoint here was not met for this trial, so for this readout. So, um, but if you look at the uh, low dose versus the high dose, there was a trend that the high dose may have some kind of, of uh, treatment effect, suggesting that a higher dose may be better. Uh, and if we go and look um, in a pre-specified subcohort within this trial and look at progressively um, milder subsets of patients, uh, we can see that the drug uh, might be working, but the patients would need to be treated earlier um, with a higher dose. So here you can see that you know, early, if you look at uh, patients across the whole spectrum between, with MMSE from 18 to 26 uh, score, uh, we have a 16.8% effect, uh, whereas that grows up to 23.8 and finally a 35% effect. Uh, and so while the primary endpoints were not met, uh, this still suggested that uh, cronezumab may have uh, may have some kind of an effect, and this is consistent what's being, with what's being seen in other uh, anti-amyloid uh, studies that are being reported from other uh, pharmaceutical companies. And so, uh, so from this, the decision was made to still continue moving forward with the a phase three program, uh, and also evaluate what the higher um, what higher doses were safe in a smaller study. And this would be done in a more prodromal to mild population of patients. And so um, as part of this trial, we, went, we did kind of a post hoc analysis and looked for trends within the data that would give us some degree of evidence that we would be able to move forward in the program. Um, however, as part of the trial, there's also all of this other auxiliary data that's created. So you have all of the different patient visits, all the vital signs. Um, other types of biosamples and imaging data that wasn't really included in this clinical, this analysis in order to be used to move forward just with the trial. And so there's kind of this left hanging question, and this isn't just for Alzheimer's, but really for you know, all the studies that are being conducted, whether they're you know, um, clinical studies or clinical trials um, in other therapeutic areas, is really like how can we reuse these data uh, in order to find actionable insights that either allows us to identify new targets or biomarkers, or just even understanding the core uh, biology of these diseases. And so, um, so if we look at precision medicine, traditionally the uh, approach within clinical trials is you have early research and developments that identifies a target and a molecule, and this is used uh, then to go through a series of preclinical and clinical trials, and if that medication makes it uh, into, um, you know, uh, makes it through the trials, it will then be end up in pra clinical practice. Uh, however, this is a very rich source of information um, that was traditionally not really reused. And so there's this concept of um, repurposing the data, referring to this as reverse translation, where you take the results of the clinical trial and all the samples and other information and feeding it back into research and development. And so uh, while this is, you know, may sound like something that has been done frequently within academics, in the clinical trials world, um, these two parts of the organization really have been uh, separated. And so this is still kind of a new, newish idea over the past few years around how do we actually operationalize uh, reusing clinical trials data and putting it into the hands of bioinformaticians and data scientists. 
Uh, however, uh, if you take the data from a clinical trial and go and hand that over to the data scientists and bioinformatics folks that are sitting in research that have never seen uh, this type of data before and don't really understand how clinical trials are designed, et cetera, um, you're gonna end up seeing, they're gonna have a hard time actually using that data. And so this is um, a figure from a Forbes article that, was, that came out a few years ago that, talk, that surveyed um, data scientists and tried to, uh, or asked them like, kind of where they spend their time. And so you can see here that they spend 20% you know, of their time collecting data sets, and then you know, another 60% just trying to clean them up and make them reusable before they get to the fun part of actually doing their data analysis and, and training their models. And you know, I'd argue that probably within biomedical sciences, it might even be more than 80% that you spend uh, trying to get your data, wrangle it, and actually use it. And so, um, so we have this kind of question of how do we pay this price only once? and uh, push all this data curation and integration up front so that the people that are trained to do analysis can get directly to work. And so that's where we introduce uh, this, this concept of FAIR. And so as we heard uh, in Michelle's talk, um, FAIR is really providing the, the, uh, the principles around which we can uh, make optimal reuse of data. And so, um, so interestingly, the FAIR principles have really made their way also into industry and so uh, this is something that Roche wide, uh, the FAIR principles have been like a rallying cry that I see in like all of our internal presentations where it's like they discuss needing to make data FAIR and the FAIR principles are really the, um, like the, 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 the war cry around how we can be better stewards of our data uh, to the extent of which is that there are internal like uh, projects where we've hired internal in, uh, data curators and integrators and created a variety of, of new positions that are focused just on making data FAIR. Um, and so, just briefly uh, to go over kind of where some of these challenges arise and kind of where these, um, where, where the FAIR principles are actually being applied. So, um, as you guys probably already know, so clinical trials have, generally have, are multi-site. So we have all these sites that uh, generally collect a variety of different types of data uh, that go to different vendors that provide certain types of analyses or run assays that then get fed uh, back over to us uh, through these different vendor services. And uh, these are fed into either like our sample biobanks, uh, where we keep track of the actual physical samples, um, or the actual uh, assay results or imaging analysis results uh, that then go into in more of like a CSV or like tabular form into a clinical data warehouse. And so when these data come in, they're in a very raw form and they um, are not ready for analysis. And so the idea of being able to make these analysis ready means that we need to harmonize them and bring them under uh, certain metadata standards. And so um, one of the first stages after the data come in is that we need to apply standards um, that can then be used to derive different measures downstream that are used for the actual uh, deliverables for regulatory approval, et cetera. And so the standards that are used are uh, called CDISC. And so as of uh, December of 2016, the FDA requires that any uh, regulatory filing must follow the uh, CDISC standards. And so this is very much the kind of stick approach where it's like you, you shall follow the standards. And so this has helped and forced adoption of uh, metadata standards within um, the pharmaceutical industry. And so um, the idea then is that for clinical scientists that are working with the data that are part of a, a trial, uh, that the data is, is more or less fair and follows these standards. But you might ask kind of what is CDIS and you know, kind of what is this, this framework? And so CDIS stands for the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. Uh, so it's been around for, I think, since the uh, mid, mid 2000s or so. Uh, and it really is a framework that covers a broad spectrum of different standards here. So everything from planning a trial, uh, for the, so the protocol and study design through the actual data collection that's sent in through different vendors, um, as well as data tabulations. Uh, so these are kind of the core like, workhorse of what we actually end up using. Uh, and so this is the, the SDTM standard, as well as uh, data analysis standards where the, the data is basically organized in a way that is um, that's specific for different uh, deliverables and figures uh, that are part of the clinical trial milestones. And so just to look a little bit um, closer at the SDTM standards, so SDTM is broken down into a variety of different implementation guidelines. Uh, so for medical devices, tabulations, or people that are actually not participating in the trial, but are the people surrounding them. So these could be family members or uh, physicians, et cetera. 
And then there are, are more uh, domain-specific standards that describe how to collect data around questionnaires uh, or pharmacogenomics information and uh, therapeutic extensions that go into areas like Alzheimer's or asthma, et cetera. Uh, in addition, there are also um, a set of controlled terminologies that are allowed to be used. And so looking at the core SDTM uh, implementation guide, we have um, a variety of different classes and each of those classes have uh, what are called the different domains that model specific types of, of um, data sets. And so these classes go from special purpose, which will be something like de demographics, or to these three different classes of general observations, which go into interventions or specific events or findings uh, that have um, their own specific descriptions around what's important to be captured, as well as other kind of auxiliary pieces like findings, trial design, and also relationships between data sets. And so looking at an example of one of these, so the data that comes in to uh, our organization from uh, the different sites uh, may be organized kind of like this, um, this lab test results here at the bottom. So we may have a study number um, that we can map over directly. Uh, we may have some patient identifier where we need to modify the header or the column name, uh, but then uh, also modify the value. So just here it's just removing a dash, but it might, could also be applying some other type of transformation. Um, and then you can see that these other fields also map over. But in addition to those mappings, we also include additional codes. So here we have basically key value pairs where uh, you have the lab test name, uh, what category it's in, the units that it was collected with, um, as well as uh, being able to bring in knowledge from, from outside, so from the World Health Organization or other places uh, that say like what that value is, um, what the low range is or the high range. And so really this is kind of augmenting the data that you receive with additional information that can be used to automate downstream analyses um, and speed up like, our ability to, to generate deliverables and results. Uh, however, uh, across a large organization like this, how are you able to uh, pull all this information together and, um, and be able to follow like, the same common guidelines? And so really this, what this comes down to is data governance and being able to have a metadata repository, so a core location where everybody references for the, the gold standard of how to represent information. And so internally we have something called the uh, Global Data Standards Repository. And so here we are able to model each of, the, of these SDTM domains. Um, so this has all of the different classes that we can access as well as what the applicable or, or valid values are for each of the fields. Um, and then also breaks down for each of the kind of columns, like exactly what the scheme is that you're allowed to use. Uh, and furthermore, we uh, create releases of these standards and so that uh, when you have some specific trial, they have to use specific uh, versions of the standards. Um, and this whole metadata repository is actually kind of interestingly modeled in a fair way. So it, it also uses um, kind of linked data or RDF in the background uh, and is natively like a, a what's called a triple store that models all of this relative information. So all the terms, IDs, and versions also have these URIs or unique identifiers that can be referenced. Uh, and so um, in addition to this, uh, so that's part of the actual clinical trial process. But for discovery-based research, we need to be able to take um, not just these uh, clinical measures and be able to pull those over, but we also want to take the biological samples from these studies and be able to feed those back into research for other uh, exploratory assays. Uh, and we want to be able to provide those uh, to the bioinformatics scientists and data structures that they're familiar with and able to use. And so we can uh, pull both the clinical data that's already been harmonized and follows these uh, nice standards uh, into, um, into a, a data structure that we can then provide to bioinformatics scientists in a fair way. Um, and the, the data structure that many of these folks are used to using, at least within our organization, uh, follow uh, something from uh, a group called, uh, or a organization called Bioconductor. And so the idea is that we can eliminate this 80% of time of cleaning all the data sets up by using these curators and integrators that pull the data sets together into these nice, um, concise data objects, and they can start with their analysis right away. And so we may have a variety of analysis type, or uh, assay types like RNA-seq, uh, nanostring, or fluidime uh, that can be integrated into these multi-assay experiment objects. And so these are data structures that provide all the methods uh, for manipulating and integrating um, multiple assays for, in this case, a given clinical trial, so that you have efficient way to construct these uh, in subset 
and um, as well as a variety of other types of an analysis, so like survival analysis and other tools that can operate on top of these objects, as well as building dashboards and interactive apps uh, using tools like Shiny. And so, um, you know, but doing this is hard. It's not something that is done, um, is, can be automated. So it's really something that is, is highly custom and you have people that have to go in and do manual quality control, make sure all the pipelines for the assays are following the same uh, versions, as well as mapping all of the different identifiers, which is extremely challenging. And so what we wanna be able to do is provide the consumers of these data um, so that they can trust them and be able to reuse them and also discover what data is available and what results are being provided. And so along these lines, so we developed a, uh, a system internally that we call GREX. And so what is this? So it's a system for uh, recording, tracking, storing, finding and retrieving computational results, including data and these uh, multi-assay experiment objects uh, in a fair manner. And so the key goal is really to apply the fair principles, uh, but applying them to uh, generated exploratory and also one-off uh, types of, of analyses. So not something that can be like incorporated into a standard uh, pipeline. And so there's our, our logo. So it has a dinosaur because dinosaurs are cool, but also um, because the idea is we want to be able to leave behind uh, this kind of like archeological record of all the information that went into constructing both data and results that people can then you know, unearth later and use. And so um, GREX is based upon four pillars. And here I have kind of a simple mapping to FAIR. However, I guess it could go into more detail with how that I know about the FAIR metrics. Um, but we have um, the kind of core piece is just an archival system where we can store a standard uh, directory structure of the data that's being um, produced along with metadata. Um, a provenance pillar that is used to basically create uh, relationships in a graph around how the different results of data are connected. A discoverability portal for being able to find, find data um, and also this other component of reproducibility where we can take the code and data um, and environment that's submitted and be able to reproduce or, or provide certain guarantees that the object you're consuming uh, was actually constructed um, by the system and could be reproduced. And that, that piece, um, you know, my next point, is that the R in, in FAIR is not for reproducibility. And so GREX really provides um, some extensions and additions to FAIR where we want to be able to intrinsically link code uh, and results and also be able to um, include all the versions that went into producing uh, some piece of, or some results so, um, so that you'd be able to reconstruct the environment for later uh, reproducibility. And furthermore, the client that we're using uh, is able to do some, some smart things in terms of introspecting the objects that are being created uh, and be able to um, generate metadata that, um, that really describes exactly what took place during um, the construction of some data set. And the reproducibility part is something we're still working on, uh, but that's uh, also uh, something we're developing. And so just to give you an idea of like how this information flows through the system, uh, so there's an R client that uh, primarily works on, right now is within um, R Markdown. And so you can take an R Markdown file, so this is a description of both the code and also the narrative along how either a piece of data or result is being uh, integrated or created. Um, and then uh, submit that into the system where it constructs something we're calling a client bundle, uh, where it has all the metadata for the versions of R, um, all the code, you know, who's doing the submission, um, and all this other um, information of the actual data objects, or for RMD, it will also include like the uh, HTML file so you'll be able to see the report. And so this is handled by a controller uh, that then stores this in the archive, um, and also, uh, so the metadata that's constructed uses something called JSON-LD, and so that's loaded into a provenance uh, triple store, so this is represented as a graph, so this will allow us to link across different R sessions for the objects that are being um, submitted to the system. Uh, and then also a publication step where all this information is made available, where the dis this discoverability portal is able to query and download, uh, query the provenance and also download those results. And then we have just a small, um, a couple of screenshots of that. And so this is um, just kind of like one of the, one of the interfa like early interfaces of what the system looks like. And so this provides you just like some simple facets like you're used to being able to see. Um, it also provides a free text search and, um, well, free text search and, and pretty much any, any search that the solar search engine um, that uh, supports. And uh, all of the results that are submitted 
get a unique identifier that's based on a hash. Um, and then also metadata that's actually extracted from these R objects themselves. So if you submit a plot, it can go in and grab the title and the axes and, and other related metadata. And for these multi-assay experiments, it can also read out the, um, the actual variables that are consistent with this uh, CDISC standard. So then we have the actual IDs of like, within the data sets, what um, kind of information can be made available and searched um, and retrieved from the object. And then for, um, yeah, and then just for like an individual result, um, it has links to be able to download these. Um, eventually we'd like to include links to other data sets that may be related uh, to the one that was submitted. And then also the code that, um, the actual exact code that was used to submit the object. So we actually traverse the kind of execution, execution path of all the func top level functions and provide a description of what called what. So you actually know exactly what code was executed uh, to submit that object. Cool, so, um, so the, the GRX platform implements uh, some of the FAIR principles. So we, we store results and associate metadata uh, with persistent IDs. Uh, we make them findable and accessible and we're partially interoperable using this JSON-LD standard. So we map to some public um, uh, uh, vocabularies such as you know, schema.org or DCAT um, for describing the data sets themselves as well as the prov ontology. And uh, we also make these data sets reusable uh, through these R packages called History and Tracker. And so these two tools are the kind of smarts behind the client that does all the metadata extraction. Uh, and so it really just, these are used to really describe um, exactly what took place during the session. And um, so that's kind of the summary of, of where GREX is at. And so I'll add here uh, that, um, so out of the, the bioinformatics group, so both these, uh, the history and tracker packages um, are shared, so those are open source tools. And um, along with that, there are probably 36 or so other packages out of the group that have made their way onto Bioconductor's open source tools. And uh, with that, I wanted to segue over to this talking a little bit about, um, you know, I've talked about how we're processing data, making it available for our internal sharing, but there are also some external sharing efforts that I wanted to make you aware of. So one is something called the Clinical Study Data Request uh, website. And so this is a collaboration across um, several different clinical trial sponsors to make the actual patient level data available uh, to external researchers. And so this uh, also has a website. And so if you go and browse this site, um, you can view over 3,800 trials from across these different organizations and submit requests to be able to download the patient level data uh, and use them in your research. And so at Roche alone, there's a little bit over 200. And so this number is gonna continue to grow. And, and there's a lot of internal um, uh, kind of effort to go into making these data available to the um, outside community. And that's seen as, as something that's valuable to contribute back. And along those same lines, and to link back to the Alzheimer's uh, story that we started with, so the Alzheimer's uh, pre uh, Prevention Initiative, so this is something headed by the Banner Institute. Uh, so we have a collaboration with them for this Columbia trial. So this is um, a study of, it's actually closer to 250 patients um, that are enrolled uh, that uh, have this um, familial early onset AD. So this is um, essentially all the people that are in this trial will get Alzheimer's disease at some point in their life. And so uh, we're enrolling people as early as 30 years of age. And so they're taking our, this cronuzumab uh, drug starting early in life, and then we're looking at other primary points in terms of cognition and imaging uh, to understand if we can delay the onset for, for, of Alzheimer's disease for these folks. And so, um, so with that, I just want to make one, one final point around this is that um, I think that data standards and this, these notions of harmonization and the open source tools uh, and software and platforms uh, that are being constructed by the community are a great place where people in industry and people that are in academics can collaborate in order to move the field forward. Um, there may be you know, competitive space in the actual development of molecules, but um, in terms of uh, you know, actually collaborating on um, projects like CDISC, which, we're, which Roche is an active contributor to, um, I think that that is something where we can you know, contribute and move the whole field forward. And so with that, um, I'll acknowledge the, the GREX team and folks within bioinformatics, uh, as well as our clinical data standards uh, team, and then the folks that I'd worked with um, on AD and the Cronusomatic Public Program. And with that, I can take any questions.
So while we take a few questions for Nolan, maybe I can ask the other panelists to come and sit on the chairs. Uh, Nolan, uh, that was a great talk. Um, in terms of the R tools that, you're, that you've developed for the clinical, for the, I guess the bioinformatics people that are using the data that comes out, yep. um, how does their R workflow change um, when their, their analysis is being tracked by the GREX system? Like, does, is anything actually different, or do you have to code differently, or can you just yeah, talk about that a bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the, the tracker project, or the tracker package, um, so you do need to do a library tracker call at the beginning, and essentially what that means is it'll keep uh, track of all of the different evaluations of functions as you're going along. Um, and, uh, but other than that, they don't have to change any part of their workflow. Uh, when submitting an R markdown file, uh, there's actually a separate function called knit and record. And so that basically sticks with the whole like literate programming. And so you basically just feed that an R markdown file, it evaluates that, and automatically kind of loads this tracker uh, package and keeps track of everything that's going on. And so you really don't have to modify the workflow of you know, the, the analyst that's working with the data, which has ended up being like, I mean, it's a critical piece of, um, you know, if you want adoption, don't change somebody's workflow. Yeah. Another question in the back here? And, and thanks again for the talk. Um, two very related questions. One is clearly a lot of moving parts yeah. in this whole well-engineered system. How do you keep the sheer complexity of it from overwhelming users? And second, you talked a lot about you know, what you're trying to deliver. What evidence or feedback do you have that those mechanisms are useful beyond compliance or beyond sort of tracking things, but their people are able to do things they couldn't do otherwise with that? What are your success stories? Yeah, so, so on the, the first part, yeah, I mean, it, it, is very, um, it is very complex. And so mainly the way that we've done this is by scoping down um, to specific use cases. So we'll use like cancer immunotherapy, and we'll just focus just on a GREX that supports the use cases that are around um, that specific project. Um, and in terms of the complexity, or I mean, in terms of like uh, success stories, um, so I mean, even internally, this was released fairly recently, but we got a lot of good feedback uh, from folks. I mean, they're really used to working on like file systems and directory structures. And so just like migrating to web applications that actually have the data and uh, providing tools where they can you know, computationally access these R objects from a session um, and do searches for certain studies and see what data is available, um, that's still like a step forward from where they're kind of currently coming from. And so from what we're hearing back, yes, um, they, they support it, but there are a whole bunch of other issues around data versioning and you know, uh, people will identify, oh, there's an issue with you know, this data set and we have to go back and, and redo it. And so, um, so that there are challenges that are unsolved there, but um, you know, I've been learning too from other projects that are similar to this, um, even here at this conference, and trying to understand uh, what the best path forward for doing like data versioning and other types of things as well. 